I'm Effie Parks. Welcome to Once Upon a Jane, the podcast. This is a place I created for us to connect and share the stories of our not so typical lives. Raising kids who are born with rare genetic syndromes and other types of disabilities can feel pretty isolating. What I know for sure is that when we can hear the triumphs and challenges from others who get it, we can find a lot more laughter, a lot more hope, and feel a lot less alone. I believe there are some magical healing powers that can happen for all of us through sharing our stories, and I'll take all the help I can get. Once Upon a Gene is proud to be part of Bloodstream Media. Living in a family affected by rare and chronic illness can be isolating, and sometimes the best medicine is connecting to the voices of people who share your experience. This is why Bloodstream Media produces podcasts, blogs, and other forms of content for patients, families, and clinicians impacted by rare and chronic diseases. Visit bloodstreammedia.com to learn more. Hello, friends. Welcome to the show. I'm Effie Parks, your host. I'm so glad you're here. If you have a Roku or an Amazon Fire Stick, you must download the Disorder channel. And if you don't have one, you got to get one. It is an amazing channel with hundreds of rare disease films. And the newest show, Pain Points, is a quick five-minute episode. It's hilarious. And the newest episode happens to be with one of my favorite people on the planet, Patrick James Lynch from Bloodstream Media. Go check it out now. Today's episode is with a really special woman who has been on quite a bit of a roller coaster for the last couple years. Her husband, Scott, got sick from a cancer and it was very aggressive and he died fairly quickly in July of 2020. He was in the middle of creating a documentary where he was highlighting the rare disease and families impacted by acute flaccid myelitis, AFM, when he passed away. His wife has decided to pick up the pieces and take the torch and finish this story. So she's immersed herself into learning how to make a film. She comes from the background of SLP, a speech pathologist. So this was all new to her, but she felt compelled to finish his work. And it's also kind of added on an extra layer into the story of her exploring her own grief and loss and the process of moving forward in that. Because we all deal with grief in our lifetime, no matter what, and it's time that we start talking about it. So it's a very fabulous story. I cannot wait to see this film. It's called When the Lotus Blooms, and it's going to be out in fall of 2023. So I hope you enjoy my conversation with the lovely Sarah Potter. Hi, Sarah. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. It's hard not to miss you on Twitter, Sarah. I know that you've been raising money and had a really successful Kickstarter campaign for a film that you're a huge part of. So I'm excited to kind of learn more about it and share it with our families listening. So could you give us a little background on your journey so far? Yeah, absolutely. Um, So for those who aren't familiar, my husband was working on a film about a rare disease called acute flaccid myelitis, AFM for short. And he was really passionate about bringing this story of families who have had to go through this and not have any answers, not knowing the exact cause, the right way to diagnose the treatment, and just navigating that as, uh, you know, their lives change overnight. And so he was working on that. And then we experienced something very similar where um, my husband had an unexpected medical event and he uh, was in the hospital for several months. And eventually we ended up losing him in July of 2020. I just knew that this story had to be continued to told. He was incredibly passionate about it. He often spoke about it while in the hospital as, you know, thinking about kids who go through rare diseases and how much bravery and perseverance that they show that he had to do the same for them to be able to tell their story. And so it's really a a wonderful way for me to uh, not only honor his legacy, but do good in that rare disease community that he set out to do. I'm so sorry for your loss, Sarah. Thank you. And I'm also both just like holding my heart that you you're taking something that was so important to him and kind of not only like continuing his legacy, but probably it's helping you cope. And I don't want to say giving you purpose in all of this, but maybe keeping you connected. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. 
I am a speech pathologist by training and have worked uh, in the space of uh, different conditions that re require rehab. So I've had an interest in this since he started. And, you know, I, I always thought I would be a part of it, but I never thought that I would be the one continuing it and producing it and making sure it, it happens. So it does give me a lot of purpose and, and a new career, which is really exciting. So it's been, <laughs> it's been uh, a lot of learning and a lot of fun. Um, and I've uh, really appreciated everything along the way. Yeah. Can I ask your husband's connection to that specific rare disease community and what made him kind of decide to make a film about a rare disease? Yeah, absolutely. He uh, was active in our local live storytelling community where there was monthly events of storytelling. And he had run into a professor of public health at a university nearby and her, her uh expertise was in epidemiology. And after she had learned that he was a filmmaker, she just went up and introduced herself and said, hey, I have this story. I'm connected to uh, a mom friend of mine who has a little boy with AFM. And I really like your thoughts on, on how to make a film that could create some change and impact. And so they sat down, you know, the next week, talked about this family, talked about what the uh, condition was and where people were at with it. And um, he was hooked. And so he had worked for a better part of the year trying to gain the funding and the research and everything else that needs to go into a film before you start filming. Mm, I love that she just like accosted him there at the storytelling event and that the stars aligned for that meant to be people are put in your path, right? Yep, absolutely. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> what are some of the things that he used to tell you about the AFM patients that he was meeting throughout his filming? Yeah, well, he uh, right bef a week before everything happened with him getting sick, he uh, ended up going out to California to film a family who um, is actually a grandmother who is raising her granddaughter with AFM. And they spent the better part of three days together just getting know to know each other and filming. And I feel like they were family after they left. They were so welcoming. They were so grateful to have somebody coming to them for once instead of, you know, just beating on the door trying to get anybody to listen. And he just took it all in and was just, you know, we have kids who are now eight and four, but at the time they were one and five. And, you know, parenting is difficult and hard and time consuming, but he saw that they had all these treatments and medical appointments and insurance battles. And he just could not believe their amazing attitude and persistence to keep looking for the answers and keep advocating for themselves. Wow. I think especially when you're coming from the outside rings, right? And you haven't really been exposed to rare disease or even like medical complexities in general, that it's quite the aha moment into a world that you sort of knew existed, but you really never looked at because it had nothing to do with you. Absolutely. And I think once you know what some families and, and patients go through, you're, you have a newfound appreciation for what they've been through and, and what kind of support they need. Yeah. So after your husband passed away suddenly and the film was just kind of sitting there, how much more work was there to do? And tell me the story of how you decided that you were going to take it on. Yeah, there was quite a bit. Like I said, a week before um, he had gotten sick, he went out and did film this family. His intention was to make a uh, film to give to investors to helpfully get it funded and get it out there. And so I would say, you know, there was there was just a, about 30 minutes of film, usable film that was made. And I knew, though, that mentally and, you know, heart wise, he had invested so much more than just that 30 minutes of filming. And it was so important to him. So I went to his mentor who had founded a storytelling and film company. And I said, I want you guys to make this like you taught him everything you knew. You've always been there. I would love it if you guys took this on. And, you, you know, they said, well, let's talk about it. But maybe it would be kind of neat if you came along with us on an internship. And I was like, internship? I'm, do you know I'm a speech pathologist? Like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't have any background in film. Like, I know a little bit just from tangentially from my husband. But like, no, I, I can't do this. And plus, it was like in the middle of pandemic. I was five months post 
you know, losing my husband. And that was kind of my go to of just like shutting things down, not taking risks and kind of being like, no, I, I can't do this without really thinking about it. And so I said no, and um, I told a couple of my family and friends, like, hey, isn't this crazy? And they were like, what are you talking about? You have to go and do this. And um, I was like, really? Like, I mean, I don't want to, like, be a burden. They're like, they asked you. I think you should go. Worst case scenario, you're, you know, you're getting a break and you get to to see what it's like um, to be in a film production with some of your husband's closest colleagues. So. I eventually did decide to go and it didn't hurt that the production was in Hawaii and I went out there and got to be an associate producer for a week and just fell in love with it from there. And I kind of just jumped in from there like, hey, I could do this and there's no reason why I can't. I'm surrounded by a lot of supporters and people who can help. And I, I think it would be great for both me and, and just to know, still have Scott's voice in it from my perspective of, of his thoughts as while he was making it. I think that's my favorite part of your story is kind of that unexpected response that you got handing off this like beautiful life's work (laughs) piece that didn't get finished to his friends who you knew you could trust and would take care of that baby and then them inviting you. I just think that's so special. It absolutely is. And, you know, I think a lot of times in grief or, you know, when something unexpected happens with a diagnosis or hospitalization, a lot of the people that you don't expect show up for you and show up in the right way that you need. And I didn't know these people at all. I had never met them. And for them to kind of direct me on a new path and a way to move forward was huge. Yeah. What do you think it means to your husband that you're you're taking over this film project? I think he would be very amused to start with (laughs) because he would be, you know, I was always the very like, okay, we have to be careful. We can't take too many risks. And then all of a sudden I decide to, you know, quit my full-time job and go into a new career. So he would be very uh, amused, but very happy because, you know, he, he would know that somebody was taking over that deeply cared about it and it had some background in the disability and rehab space and um, I think he would just really love that I was connecting also with you know his filmmaker community. You mentioned grief and the people that show up that you wouldn't ever expect to be part of your journey and then maybe even some of the most profound people. Mm -hmm. And I wonder now that you've kind of been exposed to this rare disease world and you've been so immersed in it, how does your grief that you've been living with and that you'll live with forever, how does it align with the families that you're meeting now and the stories that you're kind of pulling out of them? There's definitely a lot of parallels. I mean, our stories are very different, of course, but when I do talk to the families, I I do have that ability to connect with them of understanding what it's like to just be going about your day to day and all of a sudden uh, something changes in a, a split second and your your whole world is different from now on. I think that's its own grieving process um, in itself. And then the other parts of it is, you know, there's a lot of things that people say well-intentioned and well-meaning to try to quote unquote fix your grief. And I try to let people know that, you know, grief is healthy. Grief is an extension of the love of someone that you lost or something that you lost. And to try and fix it makes that person feel like their grief isn't valid. And so really helping that person carry the grief with them and continue to say the person's name or talk about, you know, what their life is like now and not avoid some of those topics that may seem like they should be hands off, but they really just need to be out in the open. And so we've we've really connected very quickly because of that shared experience. Yeah, I really think that that's probably going to bring so much more out of the storytelling from them and then how you choose to edit it in the end because you identify so closely with that piece and you're nurturing it and you're not hiding away from it, right? I think people can be so afraid. Right. You know, also a very important aspect is that grief is definitely not linear and there's no such, I mean, there are stages to grief, but they are not (laughs) pretty categories like they tell you. So it's, it's definitely a process and a journey um, that you're just on once it happens. It makes me think of the journal from Megan Devine called The Carrying What Can't Be Fixed, How to Carry What Can't Be Fixed, right? Absolutely. She's actually been really instrumental in, in my grieving process of just 
flipping grief on its head to, you know, for me at least and what my perception was and makes it a lot easier. I don't want to say easier, but it makes it more manageable to go through it when you're given permission to grieve. Yeah, when you're given permission to grieve. I was going to say, what are some of the most helpful resources that you found in your grief journey? Yeah, certainly um, her book, It's Okay If You're Not Okay, has been wonderful. Even just following her um, Facebook and Instagram posts, like to have they have little snippets where I was like, oh, this is exactly what I want to communicate to people. Uh, like I know people are well-intentioned. I don't want to shame them for trying to help. But also I think people too are looking for things to say or things to do because they also don't know how to manage, you know, someone who's grieving. And, and that goes back to just grief being a taboo topic for a lot of people. Um, but we're all going to have to do it at some point in some way. So she's certainly been really wonderful. And I just, you know, through some of those concepts of taking it day to day and realizing that what you're feeling is okay and there's no right or wrong way to grieve. And also just making sure that you don't let your loved one's name or or memory um, be forgotten, because I think that's a a fear of many uh, people who are grieving. I love that it's also like building an army, right, of people who finally feel seen and who feel like they can show up and talk about their grief in a way and help other people understand it and be more comfortable about sitting in the room with it. And that's just going to ripple out and make this more normalized and make people more comfortable with just leaning in. Yeah, you can feel really isolated, like nobody's ever really experienced something like this. Somebody else has been instrumental, somebody I think you know is um, Becky Sansbury on Twitter, and um, her book, just I really related to a lot, even though it is about rare disease. Again, there's a lot of um, crossovers for my story as well. So she's been, she's a lovely grandma, (laughs) she likes to be called. (laughs) She's everybody's grandma. I actually got to hug her like three days ago. Oh, I'm jealous. Yeah, uh, Becky Sansbury, who you mentioned. Yes, she also wrote a book called After the Shock. I highly recommend it for anyone who's experienced a crisis. You can find it on Amazon or probably order it from your local bookstore. Yeah, it's wonderful. And and so is she. I know. She's the best. And she's even cuter in person. Uh, If you can only imagine. (laughs) (laughs) So what have you kind of discovered about the power of storytelling? I mean, you're not only telling the stories about these rare disease kids, but alongside this, you've been telling your story this entire time. Were you kind of into it like your husband was? You said he was part of a storytelling like group or whatever. But I wonder, is this something that's new to you? And what have you learned so far about the power in telling a story? I think I, you know, have loved storytelling in different ways. I just didn't equate it to what I'm doing now. I've been really into my own family history and just history in general since I was a kid and always curious about, was this story really true or how did this really happen? And asked a lot of questions as a a young child, much to my parents' chagrin. But (laughs) I, you know, speech pathology is all about communication and people being able to to share and connect with other people. And I think at the basis, that is what storytelling does. Um, And when you connect with other people versus a disease or statistics or medical terminology, I think the ability to understand what that person is going through is just infinitely more apparent to somebody. Whereas, you know, a lot of people start zoning out and, you know, there's so much the people that are out there in so many causes, but those those storytelling principles hold true in not only getting people to connect, but also um, getting them to act as well. And so I've really seen that significantly throughout this whole process of fundraising for the film. Yes. So what advice do you have or lessons learned or even kind of inspo do you have for families listening who are considering making a film? I would say, number one, if you have a real desire to tell your story, think about what is the takeaway? Who is your audience and and what do you want them to feel and what do you want them to do? And I think, you know, everybody has two elements of a wonderful story in this this uh, rare disease community of something that is unique certainly and something that is inspiring which are the sort of two characteristics we look for a good story but directing who's going to be watching that story and and what you want them to feel and what you want them to do i think is super um, important and if somebody approaches you if you're on board with those um, goals as well 
It is a commitment. We don't come in and say, hey, we're going to sit you down for an interview and we'll be here for a couple hours and then see you later. For us, this documentary is following people in their real lives and them being open and vulnerable to us being a part of those difficult, messy, not uh, always rosy and sunshiny moments. And I think that's so critical for the audience to see in particular. Um, so there's definitely, you know, a lot of um, pe people's plates who are dealing with a rare disease. But I think also when you have that partnership, you really feel like you're seeing or this is going to make a difference and that's the, the people that we've chosen to be in the documentary that's why they're doing it they they want to create that awareness yes how successful was your kickstarter like would you recommend that being kind of a platform for people or was that really difficult and stressful <laughs> in the end was it definitely the way to go all of the above. So it was definitely <laughs> very stressful and a lot of work. However, we had a very high goal of $100,000. And typically that, I don't want to say it's not a hard goal when you have a product or a book or something that's tangible. When it's a film that's a little bit you know, less tangible and something that they get mailed to their home, that's where you have to really use the power of the story to get people on board. And so I, if people are recommending a film or going to do a film, I would um, definitely consider crowdfunding, especially if you have a great patient advocacy community already. Certainly the rare disease community as a whole is a great one to begin with, but it is a lot of work depending on how much you want to, you want to go. We hired a consultant. We had a 20 member social media team that was all volunteer. And so there was a lot going on behind the scenes. Yeah, well, you did such a good job. And it was there was so much momentum on Twitter about it. It was impossible not to participate. And there was just so much love behind your story. So it was it was really cool to watch. Yeah, it was great. And I wasn't expecting Twitter to be a place to really connect. Our consultant was really surprised. And I think the rare disease community and the medical community both are, are more active uh, on Twitter than other spaces. So it was great to have that support. Yeah, Twitter's where it's at, girl. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we can't talk about rare disease filmmaking without a shout out to Bo Bigelow and Daniel DeFabio of the Rare Disease Film Festival. And I hope to see your film on their channel someday. And if you haven't met them yet, you will introduce each other. Yes, I haven't met them yet. I did discover them in the process of the fundraising. I was like, oh, wow, this is definitely people we want to connect with once we have, you know, a more tangible uh, idea of what the film's going to look like. And so I'm excited to see what they're all about. Yeah. So do you think moving forward after this film comes out that you're going to continue to tell rare disease stories or do you kind of have an idea of what's next on the horizon? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, you know, I have continued to work on other film projects not related to uh, rare diseases, but all have themes that create an impact in, in some way. And so that's what's really important to me is finding those stories that are not being told, that are very unique and inspiring and, and can create change, um, whether those are films in the rare disease space or not. And I'm certainly open to working on another film about uh, rare diseases because I've just been blown away by the community members and, and how much they care about what they're advocating for. So tell everyone when they can see your film, where they can go find it, how they can keep up with you. Yeah, it's kind of an evolving process. So our hopes is we, we have sort of like a second round of investor funding that we need to uh, get going now <laughs> versus in, in January to go through the next step of finishing the filming process. And then, of course, it goes to editing and sound and music and all those fun things. Our hope is that the film is completed by the end of summer 2023. And then once it's done, you get to shop it around to streaming services or uh, film festivals. It's kind of just what sort of attention it gets once it's out and, and going with the route that is going to get the most eyes on it is, is what I want to happen. Well, we're, everyone's so excited for you. And I'm sure the rare disease community and especially the AFM can't wait. And they're probably so grateful that you're a part of this. And thanks for doing what you're doing, Sarah. I, I really respect and admire everything that you've done in such a short amount of time with everything that you're carrying. Thank you. Well, it's been like an honor just to be welcomed into some of these communities who, you know, like you said, I'm not 
directly impacted by um, a family member having a, a rare disease, but I do feel very close and um, protective of my AFM families and just my heart goes out and all my support to anybody who's, you know, battling with a, a rare disease and and making sure that, you know, people, people know about it and, and people can help out. Well, Sarah, thanks for being my guest. I really appreciate it. I can't wait to share your story with our listeners and I can't wait to see the film. Yes, I will be keeping everybody posted on Twitter for sure. <laughs> Twitter, all right. We'll see you on Twitter. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks so much. I hope you've been enjoying this podcast. If you like what you hear, please share this show with your people and please make sure to rate and review it on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also head over to Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter to connect with me and stay updated on the show. If you're interested in sharing your story, or if you have anything you would like to contribute, please submit it to my website at effieparks.com. Thank you so much for listening to the show and for supporting me along the way. I appreciate you all so much. I don't know what kind of day you're having, but if you need a little pick-me-up, Ford's got you. Ha 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 